so happy that so many of you could join us today. The room is filling up. And just so you know, we have more than 100 people signed up on Zoom. So welcome to people who are on Zoom joining us. Thank you so much. And um, almost the same number signed up for tomorrow. So just a little bit of quick, quick um, housekeeping uh, before we begin today's program. Um, if you're on Zoom, uh, please know that we do have wonderful, two wonderful interpreters who are helping us today. And so you can listen to what uh, the presentations this morning in both English and Chinese. Uh, what you do is you, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little globe, a little world, and you click on that and it says it will give you the option of either Chinese or English. So, and if you can't figure that out, I guess type something in the chat and we'll try to help you resolve that. But I just want to give uh, a big thank you to Yun Yao Jai and Chen Wu, who are our two fantastic graduate students, PhD candidates who are helping us with translation today with very little advanced preparation. So, so we're very, very grateful to them. The other thing is, is we're going to be projecting into this room in English. But if you prefer to listen in Chinese to the Chinese presentations, there are headsets. There are about 10 headsets over there on the side. And so you can grab a headset and you can switch to the Chinese if you want to listen to the um you know, the, the the original language. The other thing is I want to make sure everybody has a program because, and if you don't raise your hand because Sam uh, McLean, our wonderful communications manager is going to hand them out to you. On the back of the program, there's a QR code. And on the QR, if you scan that, you can have access to the full description of the papers that are going to be presented during the panel. So please make sure to get a program. Um, so I also finally just want to thank our fantastic team of graduate students who have really pulled this thing together. And that includes Sophie Lay, Michael Norton, and our two incredible Ann Wong fellows, Chai Liao and, and Shui Li. And they have done just an incredible amount of work to put this, this whole thing together. So big round of applause for them. And, um, and I'll just hand it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Mark Wu, who is the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. So thanks, welcome. Um, good afternoon uh, to those of you tuning in uh, from Europe uh, online. And for those of you in China and the rest of Asia, Good evening, Wang Hao. Um, we're really delighted to have such a global audience here uh, with all of you, and especially for those of you who took the extra effort to come uh, journey across the Atlantic or the Pacific to be here with us. And for some of you uh, from across the continent, from California to be here with us, a uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, as Dinda mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Wu. I'm the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. I'm also a law professor here at Harvard. And it's a real pleasure to be hosting this conference. Um, this is the first of several conferences we will be hosting this year at the Fairbank Center on China's relationship uh, with uh, the rest of the world. And it's befitting that we begin with a look historically at perhaps the most important relationship China has had, and that is its relationship with its westward neighbors. Um, so I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm delighted for the academic conversation that we will be engaging in, but I'm also delighted uh, to let you all know that you are sparking what we hope will be a year-long conversation here at the Fairbank Center about China's relationship with the rest of the world. Um, now, two years ago, uh, my two wonderful colleagues, uh, Eugene Wong and Leonard Vanderkype, when the world was um, actually adjusting to Zoom, concerned about um, how to make sure that we uh, secured enough masks and uh, made sure that uh, you know we had enough hand sanitizers and so forth, they were thinking big. Um, they were thinking about uh, at the time, how do we use this new technology, these new ways of working together uh, to bring together new ways of sparking knowledge. And so they came to the center and they proposed to all of us that we develop an interdisciplinary research group that's focused on looking at the first millennium. Now, this is a period that, you know, I know all of you in this room focus on, but it's not one that we typically hear much about in academia. So we were delighted that, first of all, someone was thinking about bringing together into the disciplinary research group. So even more delighted that we would be focusing on a period that we at ourselves at the center have not examined nearly as in depth. And so they said, why don't we look at this era and look at how the historical, cultural, civilizational forces came together, interacted during this long period, and to look at 
its impact of China's engagement with what I think we commonly term the Western regions or the Xi Yu. Um, so that resulted in an exciting call uh, for two postdoctoral fellows through our one-on-one -on -one fellowship project. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, two very promising young scholars that um, Daniel Elliott already referred to, uh, Li Sui and Liao Taiyu, uh, join us. And for the better part of now over a year, we've uh, been working together uh, to push knowledge on this front. Uh, for those of you who've not been uh, to our Cam Lab series here, uh, please do take advantage and to join as part of that for those uh, who look at uh, all the knowledge that's being sparked at um, on the artistic uh, front, the cultural fronts and so forth. Um, there's exciting work that's already been done, uh, but there's more work to uh, to come. And really this conference is a culmination of all of that. It's a culmination of all their efforts at collaboration, finding ways to enhance knowledge. But we think of today in one ways as the end of that effort, but as the beginning of a new one, because with these new technologies that the pandemic has sparked, we also see new means of collaboration. And for this era, really, we are so fortunate to have people from uh, not only here in the United States and North America, but also Europe, China, and the rest of Asia who are interested in pushing and developing this. So um, while uh, we're celebrating the culmination of a multi-year effort here at the Fairbank Center, I also hope that we're also celebrating the start of a new era of looking back at a millennia uh, that uh, looked at um, what we uh, once were and what we uh, again can be uh, in uh, China's relationships with the rest of the world. Um, I wanna recognize that this type of conference um, is the efforts of so many different people. So I just want to take uh, a few minutes at the onset here just to recognize and acknowledge uh, those partners. Uh, first of all, I just want to extend a special thanks to Sichuan University. Um, that's uh, been uh, a collaborator both uh, for uh, Professor Van der Kuyp in particular, but also Professor Wang and many others here at the Fairbank Center. And we're fortunate uh, that we have uh, so many colleagues uh, joining us uh, today at this conference, also from Sichuan University. Um, we also have participants from all around the world, as I've mentioned, uh, including here in the United States, uh, North America, but also various institutions in China, Europe, and Japan. And we recognize that bringing all of you together, especially in person, is a rare opportunity so we're delighted to help, help facilitate that. Um, this also uh, requires the efforts and support of so many people from around uh, the university. So I also want to just take a minute to acknowledge the other partners who've worked with us to pull this off uh, in the university. Uh, this includes uh, the Department of Inter Asian Asiatic Culture, uh, Thai Cultures, the Department of History uh, of Art and Architect Department of South Asian Studies. Um, I've already mentioned Cam Lab and then also the Harvard China Fund. Uh, and then I also want to take a minute just to recognize the efforts of uh, Dinda Elliott, who you heard from earlier, uh, Sam McLean, our new communications manager, who uh, in his first month on the job stepped up to really produce all of the wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, communications that you all see. Uh, and then uh, Michael Norton and the other students and so forth who've been integral and making all of this happen. Um, so with that, let me just add a few closing remarks, which is just to say that while today's discussion and tomorrow's discussion will focus on a historical period, um, they also shed a window on our own times. Uh, they serve as a reminder of the complexity of the relationship uh, between the peoples who live in Central Asia, the Himalayas, and what we term right, uh, China today. Uh, there have been periods uh, during this first millennia and there remain periods today that are dark periods when the relationship amongst all of these people are based on fear, uh, based on uh, cultural destruction, based on repression, uh, based on uh, colonialism and the desire to assert superiority over one another. But there are also have been bright periods when this relationship is based on genuine pluralism, uh, respect for one another's culture, a desire to learn from one another, uh, what we would recognize as true periods of humanism and artistic and cultural flourishing. And so I hope that all of your work today uh, is one that's a reminder not only of our past, but also of our future, that it's when these bright periods are sparked um, that we truly have not only periods where we see greater developments in culture and art, but also 
uh, stability, uh, stability, uh, stability, stability, prosperity. Ability. Uh, that flourishes amongst all the people in these regions. So I hope that in looking to the past, we also provide inspiration for the future to come. And so with that, I just want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you all for being a part of uh, this effort uh, at sparking new collaborations with all of us and understanding China's relationship, not only with the Westward region, but with the rest of the world. So thank you all for being here. Uh, and with this, I'll turn it over uh, to my uh, two colleagues as well. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Mark Hu. This is a hard act to follow, and I will not pretend to follow it. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see all of you traveled uh, to Cambridge, some from quite a distance and others from not so far. And good afternoon and good evening to our colleagues and friends who are joining us via Zoom. Glad you could be with us as well. And a special greeting to my old friend, Hoi, who himself is traveling and has taken the time to be with us. My name is Leonard van der Kapp, and I teach Tibetan and several other things. I'm on the faculty of South Asian Studies, East Asian Language Civilization Departments, and I'm also in the Committee on Inner Asian Altaic Studies. Following in the footsteps of Mark Wu, <clears throat> I should like to welcome all of you to uh, our conference, China Westward. It is the first of its kind at Harvard, and one that will be, that will have sequels in the not too distant future. It's also my pleasure to thank the Fairbank Center, again under the direction of Mark Wu, with Dorinda Elliott, Linda Elliott, as its executive director for making possible much of this conference. <clears throat> Other Harvard entities contributed materially to the conference also deserve our profound gratitude. And I also would like to thank Eugene Wang for his great cooperation. But, and she will not like this, but I have the microphone. Special mention was made of Dinda Elliott for superb leadership. She went well beyond what might have been expected of her in the preparation of the conference. In addition, she was also ably assisted by Professor Li Shui and Dr. Leo Chai, the Anwang postdoctoral fellows at the Fairbank Center, and a team of students whom you already kind of met, at least by name. In this conference, as you will know, we'll be looking at China as she, he, it was engaged in the Western region, Xi Yu, moving westward, northwestward, and southwestward in roughly the first millennium. I, for one, and I'm sure all of you as well, look forward to the wealth of expertise to which we'll be treated during the next day and a half. And I now hand the baton to my friend, Wang Yijin, or Eugene Wang, who will also say a few words. Thank you very much. Good morning and good evening, or wherever you are. Uh, welcome to China Westward uh, Conference. My name is Eugene Wang. I'm uh, uh, I teach art history at Harvard and also director of Harvard CamLab. Uh, China Westward is a project led by Leonard Vanekam and myself, and funded by the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Today's conference is a milestone that marks both a closure and a new beginning. We light the torch here and now. And we hope that the torch can be carried on somehow moving forward. So first off, what is this concept called a China Westwood? Why it matters? Historic China in the first millennia was not as clearly bounded as our modern map makes out to be. The border was porous and shifting. Moreover, the formation of Chinese civilization owes itself to the constant interactions with the so-called Western region, Xi Yu. So where is Western region? Well, it depends on who you ask and how you define it. The narrow definition of the Western region is that you start from the west of the Jade Gate, Yumen, then you hit the Tongling, so it's somewhere between Yumen and Tongling. And then you start from the Kunlun Mountain and head to north, and then until you hit Mount Tianshan. So that's a narrow definition. And the broader definition is pretty much everywhere west of the Jade Gate, Yumen Guan, uh, which means the rest of Asia, uh, even North Africa, and even Europe. 
So Western region ambiguously oscillates between the two definitions and is anywhere between the two, in fact. So what it means for Chinese studies, since uh, we are operating in the framework of uh, Fairbank Center and Chinese studies. So what it means for Chinese studies. The Western region study is actually not about periphery. It actually made Chinese studies modern. Sinology in the West and Japan become a modern discipline around the turn of the 20th century. You can think of Giuseppe Tucci, Paul Pellet, um, uh, Otani, Kotsui, and so on. Um, it was a game changer. So uh, roughly, um, I can think of these falling areas where the uh, Western region made a difference. Uh, it expanded its scope, the Chinese studies, since uh, the focus on the pivot to the Western region. Expanded the scope from the introverted China-only self-regard to a view of China as part of Asia. It integrated religious studies, ethnography, and social customs. It produced a synergy between history and philology. It elevated what was hitherto regarded as a peripheral material, such as manuscripts and inscriptions, into proper objects of historical inquiry. In all of the above, the Western region studies is the starting point, or the Western region is the starting point. In other words, the study of the Western region is what made European and Japanese sinology, and subsequently Chinese sinology, um, uh, modern in the first place in the early 20th century. Now in the 21st century, it is our turn to take it to another level. Once again, the Western region is our pivot, our Archimedean point. Much of our project would overlap with the Silk Road studies, of course, but the project also address blind spots of the Silk Road studies. We not only follow the footsteps of camel trails, but also climb the Tibetan plateau. Some of the important archaeological discoveries in recent, in recent decades prompt us to broaden our, uh, Silk Road scope. Um, I can name two um, important findings. One is the new finds in, the, uh, in Nari that have raised eyebrows. 10th century written resource speak of an ancient civilization known as uh, uh, Zhangzhong Xiangxiong the mainstay of the Bong religion in pre-Buddhist Tibet. The Gugu Griam ruins of erstwhile pre-Buddhist monuments tantalizingly point to the legendary ancient civilization and its heavenly kingdom that later texts both record and imagine. Now we have the chance to look at the physical remains. The other set of sites and discoveries um, are the um, are also from the Tibet, Tibetan plateau, such as the Du Lan Xue Wei, Lan Quan uh, Gou, and Qi Lian. They all point to the robust culture of Tu Yu Hun, a powerful force in the borderland of China and Central Asia in medieval times, especially Tang times. Tu Yu Hun was eventually annexed, absorbed into the Tibetan Empire. In its heyday, however, the Tu Yihun people were a prominent key player in the formation of Tang-centered Asian cosmopolitanism. Artifacts and murals from the recently excavated Tu Yihun tombs reveal the large scale of Asian cosmopolitanism with motifs from Tang, Chinese, Indian, Persian, Tibet, and even Mediterranean cultures. So, the key issue, therefore, is Asian cosmopolitanism. Andre Guder Frank sees the rise of the West around 1800, a mere blip in what was once an Asia-centered world in which China was the center of gravity. Samuel Atz Head offers a narrative of the rise of the East in relation to other major centers of civilization. To Atz Head, the rise was not only economic, but also political, social, and intellectual. He argues that Tang China had achieved a multiple preeminence similar to the, that of the United States today, though in a world order more loosely drawn than that of the present age of 
globalization. So it is apparent that the push for a more global approach that sub subsumes Chinese studies is now the prevailing scholarly trend. Um, so China Westward, the study of the Western region, amounts to a historical review of Asian cosmopolitanism. What Asian then is what U US now. Lots of lessons to be learned. So today we gather to activate that learning process. And I want to thank um, Mark, Dingda, Sam, and the Fairbank Center for uh, sponsoring and funding this project. I want to send uh, Jiayi and Yisui, our postdocs, and our graduate student, um, Mike Norton, and Sophia Ray, uh, and other uh, student um, uh, for uh, helping us putting together this conference, enormous amount of work. And also I want to thank our CAMLAB staff who also um, uh, contribute uh, the effort. Now let's begin our learning process. Thank you very much.